Thank you and welcome again back to our program. The Black American Orthodox Experience is a program focused on Orthodox missions in America, insights, challenges, and how can we reach and are reaching members of the Black, Indigenous, and other communities of the Church of Jesus Christ. Our goal is to feature honest and informative conversations about what the Great Commission looks like today in contemporary America with a historical and cultural context. Today, we have a dear friend and brother uh, with us, Subdeacon Loveday Okafor, a well-educated young man and also uh, well-connected and spirited within Orthodox missions here in America and also back in his homeland in Nigeria. Uh, I'm looking forward to spending this uh, morning with him and uh, questioning and hearing about his experience in missions. Uh, Subdeacon Loveday, can you please share with us about your background in mission work and what your work is currently. Thank you, Father, for having me. Um, it's, been, uh, it's been a privilege. And I also want to thank you for the beautiful work you're doing to promote and propagate the faith amongst uh, our community of color. My faith is something interesting. Uh, my name, Love Day, a lot of people usually ask, why do you go by the name Love Day? Mm -hmm. And I tell them that uh, the name was given to me as a result of the the circumstances that uh, surrounded my birth. Mm. So my mom gave birth to me in the church. Oh, wow. She went into labor in, in the church. And on that uh, beautiful day, uh, while observing certain chores within the four walls of the church, you know, she went into labor and gave birth to me inside the church. Wow. The same day my dad got, uh, my dad got a promotion at his workplace. Mm. So, and this was preceded by the fact that my parents, my parents had issues after their marriage, five years into their marriage, they had no child. And mm. when my mom was pregnant of my elder brother, you know, she went into, I wouldn't want to say she went into hiding. She basically receded into the shadows mm. uh, for some kind of fetish belief. She, saw, she felt something was wrong. And, you know, so when she gave birth to my elder brother, my dad's family considered him a bastard. Oh. And uh, so when she was pregnant of me, she made it open and eventually gave birth to me. And it led to the reconciliation of my father's uh, family side and my mom's family side. Mm. So I was given birth inside the church. My parents became reconciled. My dad got an opportunity for a well-paying job. So my dad was like, it's a lovely day today. So what better name to give to this boy? Love day. So that's that how it came about. So I had to tell the story because ever since then, I've always had a penchant for the faith and I've always had a penchant for the church. It might interest you to learn that my father is a priest. Mm. And uh, being a priest, I served my dad as an altar boy, as an acolyte. So yeah. I spent most of my years growing up serving in the church. Eventually, I began to study and decided to join the local seminary in Nigeria. I took part uh, in a program that lasted for three and a half years, decided to study also through a correspondent program with St. Stephen's College of Orthodox Theology mm -hmm. of the Antiochian Church. Then went to the university to study, eventually, moved to America. But while I was in Nigeria, I, uh, I served in different capacities. I was first and foremost the youth uh, president of the Orthodox Youth Association of Nigeria, popularly known as OYAN. I eventually, uh, after my seminary studies, and my, grad I mean, my uh, degree, I eventually started working in the Archdiocese assistant office. I became eventually the Archdiocese and Secretary. During this period, I was always in the, in the mission field for translations, for liturgical activities, creating retreats, you know, and so on and so forth. I traveled, you know, nationwide in Nigeria with the bishop, with the priest, visiting missionaries and all that, doctors without frontiers. I was traveling everywhere with them, mm -hmm. acting as a translator because I speak about four languages oh, wow. so i was translating doing a lot of things with this uh groups that come for mission activities in nigeria mm -hmm. so it's been a long way 
been through three seminary institutions. So, <laughs> yeah. That's an incredible story. I didn't know that about you. Very beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. So as someone who has done mission work in both Nigeria and the United States, what differences do you notice and what makes a mission field in America so unique to your experience coming out of the country? So I'm going to approach the question this way. First and foremost, uh, there are peculiarities, and these peculiarities are uh, almost immediately perceived. First and foremost, we have uh, the problem of the paraphernalia for missionary activities in Nigeria not being there. Uh, there's no institution that is viable when the people that are meant to drive that institution are not educated. So we have problem with education. So most of the priests, uh, most of the people who act in the capacity of a catechists are not really equipped mentally to mm -hmm. really, you know, defend the faith as the case would be in a, in a society with a pl plethora of uh, religions and plethora of uh, you know, Christian denomination. So it's a challenge in that sense that we lack, we lack uh, institutions that are meant to educate and groom the priest in the, in the right way to, to be able to defend the faith. Uh, secondly, it is important to know that uh, in a multi-ethnic, uh, multi-traditional uh, society with different Christian denominations and different traditional beliefs, uh, one thing you definitely encounter is that you come across uh, what I could describe as a cross-cultural communication uh, barriers. Mm -hmm. You're trying to you're trying to uh, you're trying to penetrate different cultures. You're trying to penetrate different belief systems. You're trying to penetrate different people who have heard the faith already. And it's a big struggle presenting orthodoxy to them. Orthodoxy comes with a particular, uh, you know, with a particular aura. Mm. Uh, it, it has something so unique about it. It comes with a kind of, without trying to exaggerate things, it comes with a form of mysticism that is not immediately felt in other, you know, Christian denominations or even the traditional beliefs in it. So that poses some kind of a challenge because it's new to people. It's not, people are not too exposed to those things. So it takes a great deal to really penetrate, uh, you know, communities that have this uh, peculiarities. On the other hand, when you come to America, you have, you have the resources, you have the education, you have the institutions. So the question here is, who are those that are willing to subscribe or to get involved, you know, to learn these things and all that? So the differences are, you know, definitely obvious. Of course, I know America grapples with its own kind of uh, belief systems also. You have uh, agnosticism, you have atheism, you have secularism, and you have what might be described as uh, postmodernist or radical liberalism, mm -hmm. you know. So you have those challenges. So I, I think the uniqueness here is that they have a plethora of things to deal with. And uh, I think uh, people are kind of leaning recently more towards uh, agnosticism, secularism, or the most common phenomenon that they describe as uh, uh, spiritualism. I hear this right. expression, I am spiritual, uh, <laughs> you know, but I don't, you know, I don't follow what they call organized religion. Uh, I personally feel that uh, that's a little bit of a technical, I don't want to use the word jargon, but it's a little bit of a technical misplacement of what the faith actually is, because a lot of people actually believe in Christianity and believe in the Christian God, and uh, but they don't know really how to connect to this uh, faith, and they tend to express it in whatever ways that they feel it's most appropriate for them. Very good. You know, this that statement really segues into our next question. How do you combat those stereotypes about Christianity in general and the Orthodox Church, uh, in particular, in your missionary work? And what kinds of misunderstandings have you encountered? Uh, so when it comes to stereotypes, the truth is uh, I try as much as possible not to be uh, judgmental. Mm -hmm. And I don't pull out some of those trigger words, <laughs> you know, that could really make, uh, that could easily cripple conversations. So what I usually do is uh, I'm the kind of person that when you ask me a question, I question you back. So 
the goal is this. When you question the questioner, it opens up the assumption of the questioner. Mm -hmm. So I want to know what you're thinking first before I respond to you. That Very way good. I save myself. I save myself from saying things <laughs> that will cut short the conversation. So mm -hmm. I use that approach of questioning the questioner so as to determine the pathway of our discussion. The first thing is I want to see you as an individual that has you know, legitimate questions, that have uh, legitimate thoughts, and definitely should be skeptical about things. So I want to deal with your skepticism as best as I can. And as somebody that has ventured into apologetics, I kind of have a, a particular skill to responding to that. And when it comes to misunderstanding I've encountered, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't want to look at it as a misunderstanding. I usually see things from the point of view of, you know, people airing out what they think is appropriate at that time. As a Christian, you have to be humble. So right. misunderstanding comes when you're not humble. You feel like you have a superior knowledge. So I'm not immediately in that position of, okay, I know what you want and I have to give it to you. My knowledge or my faith is superior to whatever belief system you are subscribing to or you presently ascribe to. So uh, the, my goal is not to be victorious when we have any conversation. My, my goal is to give you something to think about. You know, I'm very appreciative of that answer because it's something that's um, really needed today, especially, you know, in the advent of social media and the uh, ortho bros community uh, can be very toxic. Um, and very hard in engaging in, in discussions, even among um, some Orthodox faithful. When it, when it comes now to cultural misunderstandings between communities, uh, you know, here in America, since the Black Panther move, movement, uh, West Africans and in particular Nigerians have referred to at times uh, Black Americans as Akata, meaning strange or wandering animal. Maybe you might be familiar with this. And it's caused tension between the two communities, between Black Americans and Nigerians. What have you done in your missional efforts to address this matter and even further bring about healing between the two communities? Because you're in a very unique um, position. I remember when we first met, I was very happy with meeting you because especially now hearing your background about being a PK, you know, you, you have this rich cultural tradition that you grew up with. And at the same time, you're bringing something unique uh, to missions here in America that you grew up in the church and are not a convert. So what have you done in your efforts prayerfully and in trying to take a place of healing in this cultural misunderstanding? So I would like to approach the issue this way. Uh, the term itself, a Qatar, mm -hmm. I, I consider it's a, 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 colloquial, a colloquial jargon mm -hmm. constructed by, you know, people who just have a tendency to... Uh, to describe people however they please. It is usually an environmental construction that colloquial jargon is constructed by individuals that are not exactly, um, that are not exactly having any kind of meaningful intention towards uh, people or a group of people and all that. Uh, mm -hmm. I wouldn't want us to pay it, uh, any serious attention. Of course, it is, uh, it is something to be concerned about because uh, considering the meaning that you just gave now associated with the name. But I wouldn't want to give it a serious attention because uh, it is just a colloquial jargon uh, constructed by a group of individuals and became popular. Uh, I strongly condemn any form of stereotypes because it cripples discourse mm -hmm. and uh, it's very difficult uh, to navigate any kind of conversation when people have... Uh, you know, any kind of prejudice or have any kind of, uh, you know, assumptions about any group or tribe or whatever. So I personally, I personally don't subscribe to that idea. And I think well-meaning Nigerians would not uh, use that expression to, to describe or to address anybody. I think uh, the first thing that comes to mind as a Christian, when you're interacting with a, a potential convert, <laughs> is to see them as, a, you know, whether it's a woman or a man, brothers and sisters, and you want to address them with the love that the gospel, uh, like uh, the episode of John described, Paul also described in Hebrews, you know, we should love everyone as a brother and a sister. You can only love 
God if indeed you love your fellow humans. The, the real, the real uh, missionary work, the real evangelism is actually how we live our life. So if I act out my life in a particular way or my life manifests behaviors that contradicts even simple public decorum, I don't think uh, I stand a chance of uh, converting even a soul or any individual to the faith. We have to go the extra mile to show that we care, we love, and reflect this since we're dealing with people, uh, we're dealing with people here yeah, that bears the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Humans are uh, people who bear the image of God. So I treat people that way and I will approach it that way. Thank you, thank you so much. And part of the reason why I propose that question is there's a, there's a familiar term in my parents' native country in uh, Panama that's referred to uh, towards Afro-Latinos by the name of Chombo. And it's the, uh, the cultural equivalent to what we would use here in America in the N-word. So even for myself, <clears throat> you know, coming from an Afro-Latino background, there are cultural misunderstandings that I approach all the time um, with meeting with Black American uh, pastors and laity and even families that come and visit uh, St. Simon. So thank you so much, uh, Subdeacon Love that. We thank titled you. this program, The Black American Experience. Uh, and it's because Black, Black communities in America, along with indigenous and other minority communities have been undeserved by outreach efforts from the Orthodox Church. In your opinion, how do you think we can change that? The first thing I think, uh, first things first, things I'll consider as a, a quick solution is uh, making available scholarships for, for Black individuals here mm -hmm. to have access to sound theological uh, knowledge. That way they can go back and share their faith and their experience. There's no better person, there's no better person to, to administer the faith or convert, or convert people more than uh, the people of the same tribe or people of the same culture or people of the same color and all that for you to gain uh, strength and for you to get any kind of roots in that community or in such cultures. You have to also train the people that are going to directly speak to their own people. So the first thing is to definitely make scholarships available to people that are interested, that have shown or demonstrated penchant towards the Orthodox faith. So I think that's uh, first things first. The second thing also is uh, for this to happen, you have to understand the culture of the people. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes we tend to downplay the role of culture in the lives of people. Uh, if you understand the culture of the people, it goes a long way to even, you know, opening up for you uh, that necessary that necessary uh, path to doing mission at call with them. And, and culture means some of the peculiar problems with the society that they're living, how they think, what is dear to them, and you want to make sure that you respect those things and look for ways that uh, you can accommodate them within your faith. That way you can make a, a sound entry and definitely a sound, uh, a sound opportunity for exposing the faith. Thank you so much. We have a lot of work ahead of us. Uh, as of today, there are only about 23 uh, Black American Orthodox clergy in America. And, and as a matter of fact, the number might even be a little bit uh, smaller than that because I'm including monastics. How do you believe we can make our parishes more welcoming for those who are not a part of the historically Orthodox ethnic community. You know, as you shared, um, you know, orthodoxy is more of a, a missional role uh, back in the continent, and it, it absolutely is here um, in America. But historically, Africa has always been part of the church and her tradition. So how do we, how do we handle the situation knowing that historical background that can be identified uh, through history and the traditional experience of the church, but also the reality of uh, what's going on here in America and the continent of Africa due to colonialism, separating Africans and Africans in the diaspora away from their faith. I think it's very important uh, to, create, uh, to create a scenario of a resounding welcome. A resounding welcome. If you have, and language is everything for me. For instance, if you have uh, a supposed uh, visitor to the church, I think the word visitor sometimes is visitor is somewhat derogatory i would prefer to use a guest we have a guest in church 
And when you have a guest in church, you treat them like a guest. Usually, like guest, you celebrate the guest. Uh, people like to be welcomed as warmly as possible and celebrating them. But this is something that is not common with the Orthodox Church. I mean, you might want to clap and welcome the person. And during the coffee hour, you still give the person a full attention. I think uh, language is very key. And when you treat somebody as a guest instead of a visitor, it goes a long way. And important, importantly also, we have to understand that uh, the church, our interaction with the supposed guest does not stop within the four walls of the church. You have to extend that uh, affection. You have to extend that, uh, that brotherhood and what, what have we, that community life. You have to extend it to the public square. It shouldn't just be within the four walls of the church. So the interaction should extend outside the church. Lastly, also, I think we have to start celebrating important days in the life, not just to uh, the guests or visitors and all that, important days in the life of every faithful in the church. If you have 20 people that are celebrating their birthday in church today, the priest should celebrate them, whether they are there or not, present or absent. They should be celebrated. A prayer should be offered. Mm -hmm. And the chant of uh, God grant them many years could be echoed by every faithful in church. It's, it's so warm. It's resounding. You know, it gives you a sense of belonging. It gives you a sense that you actually have a community that would play a fundamental role in your life anytime. Also, you know, visitation to homes, even if the child of a parishioner is sick, we can have a committee in the church that goes to a very large extent, that goes out of their way to visit the family, especially if they are missing in church and if maybe their child is sick for whatever reason. You can have three, four people go there get some very basic items, grocery items, and go say hello and all that. No matter if the person is rich or poor, everybody should be treated equally. I think when you have these things in play, it goes to a very large extent to telling people that indeed they belong to a community that cares for them and a community that is all welcoming. Thank you. It's an incredible answer. Uh, Subdeacon Loveday, how do you envision the American Orthodox Church connecting with the rich Orthodox traditions of Africa, while also forging a uniquely American Orthodox tradition, uh, specifically with regards to music, iconography, and other cultural elements, which may vary among churches? I think one of the fundamental uh, factors to the possible success of any missionary activity is to understand the role of enculturation, you must understand the role of enculturation. Coming from Africa, coming from a, a country with uh, a plethora of tribes and plethora of cultures, one thing we do going to different communities, again, is to understand their culture. There's no mission, there's no missionary work that works with the approach of abolition. Mm -hmm. There's no missionary work that works with the approach of abolition. We look for ways to Christianize some of those cultures. We look for ways to accommodate some of these traditions in as much as they are consistent with our faith. If they are not, if they are not in any way against our faith in terms of inconsistent, in terms of uh, not conforming to basic theological principles, then we can embrace them and look for ways to Christianize them. Like for instance, we have uh, in Nigeria, we have like a yam, we have yam festivals. On the day of the yam festival, the priest celebrates a liturgy and the entire farmers in the community come with their yams to church. And we pray over the fruits, we pray over the, the crops, we pray over all, you know, the produce that they bring to church. So now they have like a cultural dimension to it. And we have like a Christian uh, an Orthodox Christian dimension to it. They do whatever it's cultural to them outside and we bring it to church and bless that which God has given to us as a gift on earth. So there's too many ways. It's important to, you know, be very optimistic about cultures and traditions and look for possible ways to ensure that we accommodate these things and look for ways to ensure that they are not in any way going against our core Orthodox Christian beliefs. 
another question, and, and I guess it's the part B to this last question, where is the, um, the conditions or the place right now uh, back home in the continent and where do you see it here in America on the developing of African iconography? Uh, I believe there's about maybe 300 to 400 um, African saints within the church with are either African, Arab or Greek uh, that are uh, Chalcedonian. So this is pre, um, pre-schism with the Oriental Orthodox Church. Where do you see that development in, in iconography back home and here in America for the purpose of missional efforts? I would like to look at it like this. Uh, there's a deep theological and a deep spiritual content to the icons. The mm-hmm. icons are not just mere pictures. And for that purpose, for us to develop anything, it must be within the confine of the theological and spiritual dimensions that it, the icon has always possessed. So in terms of development and all that, I think the icon does not discriminate. We have icons that have uh, particular kinds of uh, drawings and all that, and they tend to very clearly reflect some cultural attributes and what have we, like we see with the Ethiopians, you see with the Russians, you see with the Greeks and all that. So I think if whatever we're trying to maybe uh, put together here, reflect exactly the same theological and spiritual content, then uh, it is good to go. But the most important thing is for us not to to come up with things just for the sake of creating uh, what I would describe as a personalizing icons for the sake of cultural needs, personalizing icons for the sake of our tribal or whatever need. But most importantly, we need to reflect the theological, the theological and the spiritual confines and defines of the icon. If that is in place, then uh, we are good to go. And I think we have already that. Most of the icons we have reflect our African culture. And most of the icons we also have reflect that the icon does not in any way uh, discriminate. The icon is universal. It is actually the reflection of Catholicism when it comes to to arts and drawings. Okay, thank you. To our listeners, I'd like to thank you again for joining us uh, for another episode in this series of the Black Orthodox Experience here in America. We'd also like to thank Subdeacon Love Day for being with us. And until we see you again, God bless you. Thank you so much, Father. Thanks for having me. Christ is risen. Indeed, he's risen.